You know, I, I realized that uh, I was talking to Jan the other day, and she she said Bob was a nominee brother. <laughs> and I said, I, I met him after that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he was already a sweet grandpa when I met him. <laughs> and uh, I, w I would like to... Uh, say something about a woman that's dear to my heart, and that's Miss Annie. I love you very much, and I think you're one of the most awesome women I've ever met. And when a lot of people would have put their loved one in a home, Annie stayed right by his side, and she took care of him, and she put up with him, and... Um, she still ran around here trying to smile, that beautiful smile of hers. And some days were just hard, huh? But Bob, not one day in this life, uh, went without love from anybody. And he, it was the same with me. Man, every time I saw him, he wanted to run, hug the preacher. And as a matter of fact, the other day when Bob passed, I... Uh, Annie was here, and Bob was here, and I believe Becky and the kids were here. And I was trying to sneak into the office without being noticed. I had just a little bit of paperwork to do, and I was going to skedaddle right back out. And I had on a ball cap, and uh, if you knew Bob, you knew that you did not wear ball caps in God's house, yeah. right? <laughs> or any kind of hat. So... <clears throat> I was trying to sneak in and back out. I don't even think I combed my hair that day, but I ran in the office, I'm doing my paperwork, and all of a sudden I hear him coming. And he walks in there and he goes, hey. And I went like that. And he goes, that a boy. I was like, man. And he said, how are you doing, preacher? I said, I'm doing good. How are you? He said, I'm doing great, never better. And that's wonderful to be able to say that before the great ride to eternity. And Brother Bob's favorite Bible verse was John 3, 16. And so I want to talk to you about that verse. I'm not going to preach too long, I hope. But you never know. I always like to throw that in there, right? That way, if I do go long, I won't get in trouble. You know, Bob liked fast sermons and fast preaching. Um, but, and I, I thought it was just because he liked short sermons, but actually it was so he could go eat cookies after church. <laughs> And it was funny because in the last year, when I came to church, he was already over there drinking coffee and eating cookies or brownies or muffins or cake or ice cream. And after church, he went right back over there. And that, but he never left church without telling me he enjoyed the message. And that was always great. In John chapter 3, and verse 14, I'll read a few verses to give you the context of this verse. Um, verse 14 says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, for Bob. Lord, what a blessing he was to so many. And Lord, we thank you for Annie. And Lord, I thank you also for... Bob's children, they've all been a blessing to me, and Lord, I want to thank you for Kathy, for having a heart for her dad, and I want to thank you, Lord, for all the things that she did for her dad, 
that made his life a little brighter some days. And Father, it's such a blessing to be around his children, Jack and Larry and Troy. It's nice to see children that love their parents. And Father, we just pray today that you would be with all of Bob's family. We pray that you would give that great comfort, that dew from heaven. As the dew fell on the trees of Lebanon, we pray, Holy Spirit of God, give us comfort, and Lord, give us peace. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I wrote out what I wanted to say. I usually don't do that, but I thought it would be a little bit faster and a little bit easier for you. Um, <clears throat> talking about John 3.16, is, is, um, it may seem like a simple thing. After all, it's one of the first Bible verses that we learn in Sunday school. And we've all heard sermons on John 3.16, but the fact of the matter is, I have met young preachers that preach on it all the time, and I've meet, met old preachers that don't even touch it because it is so profound. <coughs> As a matter of fact, G. Campbell Morgan, one of Charles Haddon Spurgeon's students, preached 15 years and wrote two volumes of commentaries and said this, I have never one time preached on John 3.16, for it is too deep for me. And Dr. Henry Dick Wilson of Princeton University, he was there for 47 years. He retired there. He wrote nine books in 47 different languages. He was one of the most brilliant theological minds to ever come to America from England. And they did a Q&A at the end of his uh, career on his last day as he was about to retire. A boy stood in the auditorium and said, Dr. Wilson, what is the greatest thing you ever learned about God? And his tears began to course his wrinkled cheeks. He pulled his glasses down and he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And so, knowing that this verse is Bob's favorite verse, I don't want you to think that Bob was in any way a shallow Christian. As I began to study this verse last week, I found everything that I read and everything that I've heard about this verse to be true. It is like a deep pool of water that you're looking down over <coughs> that you can't tell how deep it really is, but it makes you want to jump in. And so I want to just give you a few things this morning that I noticed about Bob's favorite verse. The passage of scripture is so profound and so magnificent that I think it's hard for human beings to wrap their mind around it. There's not another passage in all the Bible, I believe, that says so much to so many in so few words. It's the gospel in a nutshell. And believe it or not, I was in a church service and the preacher handed out walnuts and he said, don't open your walnut until I tell you. And at the same time, the congregation opened the walnut and there was a little piece of paper in there that said John 3.16. The gospel in a nutshell. The good news of God. Let me say it again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. As I was reading through John 3.16 over and over this week, I noticed something about the verse that I'd never seen before. You can actually spell in an acrostic the word gospel from that very verse. You take the G from God, the O from only, the S from son, the P from perish, and the E from everlasting, and L for life, and you have the gospel. It's a verse that teaches us that a poor man can get rich. 
And it's a verse that tells us that a sick man can get well. A verse that an ignorant man can become wise. A bad man can become good. And a good man can become better. In Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world. That little word so is often read over like it's not in there. And it just kind of flows like a song. So we don't really pay attention to it. But the word so means that there was quality in God's love. God didn't just love the world. He so loved the world. There was quality in his love. As I studied God's love this week, I found that God's love is an everlasting and unconditional love. It's everlasting because God is everlasting. Pretty amazing. The Bible says that he is also a friend that sticketh closer than a, than a brother. So God's love is not only sacrificial, but it's friendly. Not only that, God loved us with a passionate and intimate love. Nobody sitting here today is a mistake, an accident, someone that was born that wasn't intended on or planned for. In the mind of God, every single person here was planned by the Lord. And you're here today by divine appointment. God knew you would be here today. Just as God knew I would run into the church on Bob's last day here. What you have here in this verse, this tiny verse of scripture, is a volume in a verse. An ocean in a dewdrop. And a continent in a cup. We have the world's greatest story. It's even an anthem of redemption. Frederick Faber said in his familiar hymn, as he wrote... The love of God is broader than the measure of a man's mind, and the heart of eternal is most wonderfully kind. What a verse. God's love is real today. Bob's life was an example of God's love. I watched a man hug everybody that came into the church, and he even hugged people that didn't want to hug. <laughs> I actually heard people tell him, don't hug me. I've heard people tell him, don't do that. But old Bob, he just wouldn't give up. I would be starting the service and he'd still be greeting people in the pew, hugging them and talking out loud and shaking hands. And I'm just like, come on. <laughs> Never said anything to him about it, but <laughs> I thought about it. I'll be honest. I'd be standing up here and I'd be getting ready to preach the sermon or I'd get, be getting ready to do announcements and he'd walk over here and he'd say, you want a cup? <laughs> <laughs> Coffee. <laughs> We're a family here at New Haven and we just got used to it. I'd say open your songbook to page 216 and he'd say 345. <laughs> no, Bob, 216. Two what? <laughs> Two, one, six. Oh, okay. <laughs> we recently preached a message about our difference. You know, every one of us are different. There's, there's not a one of us here today that's the same. Not even you twins. God made each one of us with something special. And I believe that we should celebrate that difference and not tolerate that difference. Life can be enjoyable, and I kind of learned this from Bob. Life can be enjoyable if you enjoy the difference and not tolerate it. When we tolerate the difference, we get irritated. 
right? It's a whole lot more pleasurable to enjoy. And I tell you this morning that God's love is real because it is. It had no beginning and it had no end. It had no beginning and it had no end because God had no beginning and God has no end. It cannot change because God cannot change. God cannot change for the better and God cannot change for the worse. He cannot change for the better because he is the embodiment of excellence himself. He cannot change for the worse because there is nothing in the, God's power or his will to hurt himself. We can't just say God exists. We have to say how God exists. The Bible says God came from nowhere in Habakkuk. He always was, he always is, and he always will be. We can join today the Holy Spirit by saying he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. <coughs> I have confidence that every person that names the name of Christ as their Savior will someday walk on streets of glory. When I was telling Larry this morning, when his dad would go, I had a surgery and I couldn't bend over. So when I, when I would uh, come in the house, <clears throat> I would just drop my overalls and then I'd try to jerk them and pick them up with my foot. My change would fall out on the floor. I couldn't bend over to pick up my change. Every time Bob came over, he'd see that money all over the floor. And he'd just start picking it up and he said, boy, you're rich. <laughs> And after about four or five times of that, he said this. He said, man, this house, I love this house. It just makes money. <laughs> <laughs> and now he's walking on streets of gold. <laughs> Jesus is real this morning. His love is real. And his love is everlasting. God does not love because we are love lovable. God does not love because we are lovely. God does not love us because we are valuable, but we are valuable because God loves us. God does not love us because Jesus died for us, but Jesus died for us because God loves us. His love is stronger than sin, it's deeper than sorrow, and it's mightier than death. Yes, this is the greatest love story I believe ever told. And the anthem of redemption. And it's written in the key of B. Be saved. Be saved. I see four movements in the verse. Number one, the cause of salvation. God gives us the cause of salvation right in the verse. As I was studying the verse, I began to wonder, I wonder what Bob saw in the verse that I'm not seeing. Never will know till we get to heaven. But the cause of salvation, Jesus said, for God so loved the world. That's the cause for salvation. Because of God's love. Number two. God gives us the cost of salvation. It's free, but it's not cheap. It's free to every sinner. But it costs God his only begotten son. The Bible says he, God the Father, made him, Christ the Son, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. To me, that verse 
testifies and says <clears throat> this is the making of a Christian. I'm not talking about church. I'm talking about being a Christian. I'm talking about being one of God's children because you received Christ as your Savior. And all that means is you realize that Jesus died for your sins to pay for your sins so God could give you <clears throat> eternal redemption. And at some point in your life, you said, Lord, I need saving. My sin is great. <laughs> Number three, God gives us the condition of salvation. The condition of salvation is whosoever believeth in him. Whosoever believeth in him. As I began to look at all of these different things that I was seeing in the Bible in this verse this week, I got to thinking, this is the happiest verse I've ever read. <laughs> and I was thinking, maybe that's why Bob liked it so much. It's happy. Who's not happy receiving gifts? <laughs> Who's not happy being loved? And all this verse does is love us and give to us. <clears throat> Number four, God gives us the consequence of salvation. You say the consequence, yes, every decision and every choice that we make. And thank God God gives us a choice. We're the only creature that God made that has a choice. And that's love in itself. But there are consequences to every decision that we make in life. And the Bible says if we believe on Jesus, <clears throat> we have eternal life. If we don't believe on Jesus, we're condemned already. But there is a consequence to salvation. Let me give it to you. God gives us here a double promise that everybody can be happy about. Number one, you'll never perish. You'll never perish. And number two, you'll have everlasting life. Now, I didn't say that. God said that. I'm just a preacher. <clears throat> Trying to give something divine to people like me. There's just no, so much in this text. It's just difficult on how to approach it becomes hard. I tell you what I'll do. I'll talk about two nouns and two verbs and I'm going to quit. How's that? The first noun is God. And the second noun is world. The two verbs are love and gain. The Bible says in 1 John 4.16, God is love. God is love. The Bible says the, that wisdom is the principal thing, but you can't have wisdom if you don't have love. Where did God come from? He came from nowhere. That's biblically sound. <coughs> How long has he been? He's been from eternity past to eternity future. And if you didn't know it, God made you to last. He made you to last for eternity. You say, how do you know? Because the Bible says that he made man in his own image and after his own likeness. God is eternal, so he made us that way too. If we choose Christ, we can spend eternity with God. It's going to be an eye-opener for us all when we get to heaven, when we find out the depth and magnitude of God's love. Paul said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. 
And I do not believe this morning that there are words in the English language beautiful enough, beautiful enough to tell how God's love is for us. Love is an action verb. So love has to have an object or there is no love. That's why God made you. He was all alone up there. <clears throat> Nothing to love. God, love is not an attribute of God. Love, God is love. That's who he is. All love originates from God. God needed something to love. So he took the hammer of his will, the anvil of his omnipotence, and when they struck together, sparks flew and lit the night sky with galaxies of stars. And he said, this is good. This is good. The Bible says that he stretched out the earth over the empty place and hanged the earth upon nothing and said, don't move. You can spin, but don't go anywhere. <laughs> I'm gonna make a man in a minute. <laughs> and every single thing God made, he said, this is good. And I believe in my heart that every time a baby's born, God says, this is good. We have one over here that's saying amen. You just don't understand. <laughs> you say the baby's interrupting us. No, it's not. Babies do that. It's fine. <laughs> I'm probably a preacher because I cried as a baby in church and then I slept through my teenage years in church and then all of a sudden I woke up. <laughs> Can you imagine having pure, unfailing love in your heart with nothing or no one to love? God's plan was so perfect, so perfect for God, so perfect for man. And then sin entered into the garden. And God said, hey, I got a plan to fix this problem. I'm going to send my only begotten son down there. He's going to die on the cross. He's going to shed his blood. He's going to spend three days and nights in the heart of the earth. And then he's going to come out of the grave on the third day. And he's going to come back home and be with me. The Bible says, Jesus actually said, And I, when I shall be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. You see, it doesn't matter how good you've been or how bad you've been, where you come from, what color you are, what language you speak. God knows every color of every person. God knows every language of every person. <clears throat> and God loves every person. He spoke the worlds into existence. He stretched out the north over the empty place and he just hung it out there. And the Bible says concerning that verse, the pillars of heaven tremble at his reproof. Who can understand the thunder of his power? <clears throat> Every time God does something, it's good. And I believe that God does something good in our hearts all the time. And God is saying it's good, but we don't always notice what God is doing. But we know what God is doing today. There is an object that has brought us all together today. And that object is a person who left his earthly tabernacle and went to heaven. And that's why we're here. God is so great and God is so wonderful. And I know if Brother Bob was here, he wouldn't say it the way I say it. He would probably say, trust the Lord. And those few words say everything that I'm saying.
Frederick Lehman wrote a song. I'd like to read it to you. I want you to understand before you leave today that God loves you. <clears throat> there was a lady in church one day and she, she stood at the end of the message. I preached on Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so. She stood up and she said, Pastor, I've been a Christian for 56 years and tonight is the first night that I actually felt like God loved me. And that's how we should feel. Every single person should feel like God loves them. He said, Pastor, you have no idea how much sins in my life. God does, and he said, I love you anyway. <laughs> Amen. Amen. He said, I already fixed that problem. Listen to the preacher at Bob's funeral, and you'll learn how to get over it. <laughs> you see, God's love fixes everything. Jesus said, Love fulfills the law. There are 500 and something commands in the Old Testament of what not to do, 300 and something of what to do. And God said, love fixes all that. That includes you. If you'll notice in John 3, 16, it says, whosoever. Are you a whosoever? You are a who. You better be a who. <laughs> You're a whosoever. And God loves you. So what if people don't understand you? God does. Doesn't matter if people get you. God gets you. Right? Most of us didn't understand Bob, but God obviously did. <laughs> Man, I got under his skin one day. First day I met him, actually, I was at Jesse's house and I was shooing Jesse's horse. <laughs> I had the both both of the front feet done, and I was starting on the back. And old Bob come out of the house and walked over there and he said, "Hey, kid." <laughs> and I was really trying to hurry and get done. <laughs> he started talking about race horses. And you know how he bragged about racing, race horses. And while I was shooing that horse, I said, did you know a mule can outrun a horse? He goes, no, it can't. <laughs> I mean, just that fast. He goes, I'll prove it to you. I'm like, well, I got to finish shooing this horse. Boy, that bugged him. He went back in the house. He came out with his book. He goes, I can prove it. Look at this time right here. My son Jack rode some racing mules, and we timed them, and we can prove that a mule is not faster than a horse. I thought that was it, the end of it. Every time he saw me after that, he goes, still think those mules are fast? <laughs> he couldn't let it go. Even when I said, Bob, I was just kidding. I know a horse can outrun a mule. He goes, no, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> and I know I went through his racing uh, albums at least three or four times. And he knew the story behind every page. I think the last time he took me through that thing, I got home at two in the morning. <laughs> You know, we can, we've seen a lot of things written that explain and tell us about love. This is one of the most beautiful I've ever seen. The song is called The Love of God, and it says, The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen could ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care God gave his son to win. His every child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. When hoary time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who here refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure shall still endure, all measureless and strong, redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels song. 
Could we with ink the ocean fill? And were the skies of parchment made? Were every stalk on earth a quill? And every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean so dry. <coughs> o oh, love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints' and angels' song. I know Bob well enough to know that if he could give you one last message, he would tell you God loves you. That's what he would tell you. And he would tell me, it's time for a cookie. <laughs> I've noticed something this week as I studied this verse. Why it's so hard for us to understand this four-letter word, love. From what we read and from what we hear. And the reason we don't understand it when we read about it or when we hear about it is because we have to be shown. We have to feel it. It's better learned experience than not. And I want you to know today that God loves you. The Bible says that your God's mind is full of you. In Psalm 139, he said, when all of my members were not yet, they were written in his book. If I could hide in the deepest, darkest sea, you would find me there. You cannot hide from God because his love is so strong. He would find you anywhere. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Lord, I want to thank you for a dear friend. I want to thank you for Brother Bob. Lord, I'm sad that he's not here, but I'm happy that he's with you. And Lord, what a great amount of joy he brought to my life. Father, I pray that you would bless Annie. I pray that we would care for her and love her like she loved Bob. I pray, Father, that we would shower her with hugs and let her know every day that we love her. And we can travel this road together. And I, I know, Lord, that Paul said to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. But I kind of have the feeling, Lord, that if Bob had his way, he'd be walking slow and waiting for us. We ask you to bless his family. Father, thank you for everyone who came, who traveled far. We love you. And we miss you. Bless, Lord, today the rest of the service and bless. Bless Bob. Let him know we're all right. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.